So pumped to this week share with you kind of an in-depth deep dive on the things that we can do to make sleep our superpower, making sleep our superpower, which I really believe each and every one of us has within us to make that happen. It's not beyond our reach. These are all things which I really think they are simple. They may or may not be quote unquote easy for all of us, but they're really, really simple, simple things. Let's just start with my number one biggest sort of bang for your buck. Now, I I wrote a little list to myself because I didn't want to skip anything, but I put my top kind of 10 to 12, you know, about a dozen things that I really consider kind of the top, you know, list items that we can characterize as sleep hacks or things that we can do to optimize our sleep. But if you want more, yeah, please reach out and get into that Thrive community where I'll answer your questions. We're going to do a deep dive this weekend, go even deeper. But here's the essentials. We're going to get the essentials right now. Number one is light, exposure to light at the right time. So if we think back thousands of years, millennia really, to what we have been doing as humans, we have been out and about in the daytime, literally getting up with the sunrise. Always we were getting up with the sunrise, right? Because we didn't want to get eaten by predators. We wanted to get out there and actually go after our hunt, whatever that was, or gathering of berries if we were in a location where that was available. But we would get up with the sunrise each and every day and go out on our hunt, our search, get up and going. And that light that's available at sunrise each and every day is so critical for so many things, not only for our well-being or bienestar, as I would often say um, in the many countries I love to visit, but the light helps set our circadian rhythm, our biologic clock. And as you know, the two most important triggers for our overall metabolic health and our sleep really are the triggers of light and eating the food. And we'll talk about the food later on down the list. It's it's on my list of things to talk about. But right now, the light is the most critical and important thing to start our day with. So our best, most restful, most amazing sleep that occurs at night, it actually starts first thing in the morning. How amazing is that? It's first thing in the morning if you get up at sunrise and you get your eyeballs, not with sunglasses now, eyeballs to see that natural light, you will have that circadian rhythm set and you will get ready. And If you're not a morning person, don't worry. You can actually adjust to kind of this circadian diurnal um, schedule pretty quickly over about one or two weeks. If you get up every morning at sunrise, have that natural light hit your eyes. It really happens within a couple of days if you're consistent and you get out there right time. Right now, for most of us in the Northern Hemisphere, it's summer. So the days are beautiful. Sunrise is a beautiful time. It's not too cold in most places. It's nice. You can get outside. You can go for a quick walk. Five or 10 minutes is all that you got to do. It doesn't take a long, long time. But if you're exposed to that natural light early in the morning, especially within the the first couple hours of sunrise, that's one of the best, 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 best sleep hacks that I can share with you is natural light in the day, especially those early morning hours. And then at night, we'll just jump down a few steps, but at night is getting those lights off, right? What happens at the end of the day? The sun goes down. And naturally, we have evolved, been in this environment of the diurnal rhythm, right, of the day and the night. And so when the sun goes down, naturally, our body wants to prepare for the best sleep of its life. Now, who who out there has been, you know, out in nature and done either a, you know, ocean or, or river or or lake trip or whatever, where you go to bed at sundown, see a beautiful sunset, and and go to bed within you know an hour or two of sundown, and have the best, most relaxing, amazing sleep ever. Well, that's not an accident. That's because you got out. Hopefully, all during the day you were doing fun stuff outdoors. Whether it would be hiking, or if you were at a lake, maybe you're doing some kind of a water sport out on the lake on a boat, fishing. What I like to do, I love to be towed behind that boat, or or behind jumping on the wake behind the boat. That's kind of the new in vogue thing, right? The wake surfing. I, I love to do that as well. Or good old fashioned water skiing. I enjoy wakeboarding, all those things. But all day long, you're out and exposed to the light, and then sun goes down and you prepare for sleep. That's the natural way. So at night, we should be limiting our light exposure, especially those (laughs) famous blue lights, right? All the screen emitting devices, the screens, the TVs, the iPads, the iPhones, the tablets, the Kindles. I know I said Kindle. 
I don't know about you guys, but even at night, the Kindle is kind of, it's maybe a little bit better amber type light than, than our usual devices, but I would say go back to old school. Do what I do, like I'm showing you right here if you're watching on YouTube. I do this thing. This is a good old fashioned book. I open the pages of a book and I actually do it by a really dim light. I have this, uh, it's a uh, reading, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a book light and it's an amber colored book light. I read my book at night, usually about that last hour before bed. Um, so let me talk a little bit about that, about the routine part, because sleep is something you can actually prepare for. It's really a routine kind of thing. And we got a little bit into this in the, in the first podcast. I'll just break it down a little bit. Routine is important. We all know, especially us parents out there that have kids, we know how important it is to have a routine. Well, for us old farts, for us adults, <laughs> old farts, I'm just kidding. I, my kids give me a hard time. I mean, I'm turning 50 soon and they keep telling me, dad, you're getting old. And I'm like, how can you tell? I, I do everything you can do. I can surf as well or better than you. And I, I can, you know, mountain bike and rock climb and, and snowboard and ski and all these things pretty dang well. And I'm an old dude. So what? What do you have? What do you have against old guys? I'm not old. Old is in your mind. Now, I feel younger than ever. But what, um, what I'm saying here is that routine is important for all of us at every age, not just our kids, especially when we're trying to get them sleep trained. As they say, I always laugh when people say, I'm, I'm sleep training my kid. Like, what? Like sleep training? You are hopefully providing them with all of the best natural cues so their body gets trained by nature, right? The day and night cues, right? It's light during the day and dark at night. Hopefully they sleep all through the night like they were supposed to. And yeah, you can add some training if you want. I'm, I'm not opposed to training. Training is awesome. But we as adults need some of that too. We need some routine. We need some training. So I like to operate by what I call the three, two, one rule. So we're going to just get to that schedule. But the most important thing is that we try to have a routine, right? I know everybody's not technically a morning person or, or whatnot, but I would encourage you, even if you're not a morning por person, encourage you to see some of that daylight early in the day. If you can't get up right at sunrise, though I would like you to try the experiment, go ahead and try it out. Two weeks of seeing the sunrise every day, I think it'll change your life. Like I love, 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 love sunrises. But anyway, um, get out and get exposed to that light right during the day. Set up a routine so that at night you go to bed roughly the same time every night. My goal, my personal goal is 10 o'clock every night. Right now, I'll just be honest. Now, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm sucking right now at the 10 o'clock bedtime uh, a lot of the time because it's summer and a lot of places where I stay and um, I'm going to be back uh, close to my mom here real soon and I'm so grateful for that. Um, not going to get into what's going on there, but um, so grateful to be near family real soon. But when, when I am and I'm going to be spending some time there close to her, um, it's summer still and it stays light till almost 10 o'clock at night. So I'm struggling a little bit to get into bed at 10, but that's my goal. 10 o'clock. I, I try to live by a routine. I admit I'm not perfect, especially this time of year when it gets dark. Sun sets at like 920 or 930 or I don't know. It feels like it sets at 10, but it, it sets pretty late in, in, <laughs> in the nor northern hemisphere. And so um, my goal still, I set this schedule for myself. I have a reminder on my phone that pops up that says, hey, bedtime, you know, 10 o'clock, what have you, wind down. And so a schedule and a routine is critical. And I follow the three, two, one. So three hours before bed, I set myself up for what I call a food curfew. So if I go to bed at 10, I try to be done with dinner by around 7. And most of the year, that's not bad at all. But in the summer, I admit it's a little bit challenging because the kids want to stay outside and play till the sun goes down. And so we've kind of adapted to this. What we've decided to do is we still try to eat an earlier dinner and then we go outside and we play with them, whether it be a bike ride around the block or just a bike ride on our own driveway. Sometimes we literally do loops on our driveway, depending on maybe what place we may be, it could be dark already. And so we just go around our driveway. We have a little oval. We call it the oval. Like if you're a race fans out there, you go around the oval in the Indy 500 or the Daytona, whatever. You got a little oval. We got a little oval in our driveway. And so we can, we can go around that on either bikes or skateboards or whatever after dinner to get our wiggles out. And of course, limit that rise in blood sugar and of course insulin that can be done with a simple activity like walking or riding a bike or whatever after dinner. So I'm trying to do that dinner time thing even in the summer when it gets light, it stays light pretty late. I try to uh, sort of advance that, that meal time, make it a little bit earlier or I should say, um, <laughs> anyway, just try to make it earlier so that I have time 
to get three hours in of no significant caloric intake because the three, two, one rule is important. Three hours before bed, if you can, I'd say two at a bare minimum. Try not to eat any significant calories because the calories will make your body work hard to digest them and digestion is taxing. Not only it takes time, but it takes energy and a lot of energy and it's revving your body up and you don't want that necessarily uh, for sleep. I find that if I eat too late at night, especially maybe on those weekends where I might have an opportunity to go out late. My wife and I just had a chance to go out on a date last week. We like to try to do that once a week if we can. We don't always hit that, but we do try to do it about once a week because it's good for us. It's good for couples. Like, I don't know how you guys do it, but if you got little kids, like you got to take time for the couples. And, and so anyway, I digress, but couples got to have time for you know each other for yourselves if you haven't already heard about the upcoming couples retreat like oh my gosh guys you got to check this out i'll put a link in the show notes i don't think i had so far but it's going to be amazing there's a couples retreat my wife brooke and i are putting on this very november it's going to be incredible in costa rica it's going to be an adventure and growth couples retreat it's not going to be all weird we're not going to get all Um, you know, funky. It's basically having a lot of fun in the daytime, just adventuring, bonding, having meals together. And then we'll have a little bit of, uh, you know, teaching time where we sit down with some experts and relationships and and really conversation and communication because that's so essential. We'll have some little workshops and stuff, but it's not going to be crazy. It's not going to be making you feel uncomfortable. It's going to be growth. It's going to be empowering and it's going to be a dang lot of fun. So check that out. I'll put a link in the show notes or you can just go to my wife's website. She has it there at Brooke, B-R-O-O-K-E dash Hemingway, H-E-M-I-N-G-W-A-Y.com. Brooke dash Hemingway.com. Had to throw that out there because couples, guys, you got to make time for each other. got to make time for yourselves as a couple. So we do that, but occasionally if we're out late, it could potentially mess up the sleep pattern a little bit. Maybe, it depends on how late, like I think we went to a 5.30 dinner date. So it wasn't too bad actually, this most recent uh, date night that we had. But three, two, one, three hours before bed, try not to uh, have any significant caloric intake. Um, And while we're on the caloric intake, guys, let's just talk about what's the best food before bed. So naturally at night, we talked about this last week, we want to use that time to refresh, rejuvenate, to regrow the things we need to regrow that kill, you know, the old cells. We have autophagy. We do the self-eating. They get cleaned up, reused, recycled. Then we use those proteins or amino acids to make the new cells and rebuild and regrow and the muscles get reestablished and and rejuvenated. Our whole body gets rejuvenated, especially our brain. Our brain is, I think, one of our most important organs and that refreshes and rejuvenates at night. So if you may imagine, if you're trying to build and rejuvenate your body and your body's made up of amino acids or protein, protein just may be something really important to eat at night. And ding, 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 ding. Let's hear it, let's hear it. Where's the drum roll? There we go. Yeah, so it actually is important to eat protein at night. In fact, I power my protein at night. I stack it a little bit so I can, I'm trying to grow some muscle right now so I don't get that age-related sarcopenia that many of us get. So I'm trying to focus on having a little bit more protein and you'll actually sleep better at night with a little bit of additional protein because if you pack the bunch of the carbs at night, and you eat it especially right close to bedtime. Now you might get immediately kind of sleepy right afterwards because that's kind of that Thanksgiving feast phenomenon where we just stuff ourselves and we get a little sleepy and tired, but we might have a rebound. You know, all that glucose uh, gets gets uh, let out and, and it spikes and then we have insulin, which is like, oh crap, we can't let the body see all this blood sugar because it's so sticky, it causes issues. Let's pump up the insulin to get that glucose into the cells. And we often overshoot and then you can have a reactive hypoglycemia about two hours or so after you eat. And if you're already in bed and you're already sleeping by that time, like if you eat real late and then you go right to bed, well that drop or dip, that hypoglycemia may actually wake you up from sleep. It'll may actually wake you up and you'll be like, what the heck, I'm, I'm hungry, I just ate a couple of hours ago and your stomach's like growling and doing weird, you know, backflips and whatnot. And so. Don't eat within about three hours, a minimum two, but I try to shoot for three hours before bed. So that's my three, two, one. The two 
used to be for me screens, no screens, two hour before bed, but honestly, I just have such a hard time meeting that. I've altered it a little bit. I've changed it to be two hours before bed, no significant, you know, super hefty endurance or super high stress, high energy workout. You know, inter interval training, I'm not gonna do two hours before bed, okay? If I do an Orange Theory class with my wife, I'm gonna pray I can keep up because she's amazing, but I'm not gonna do it at night right before bed. Most likely I'll do that class in the morning and that's usually when she always goes and I do my endurance or high energy, high impact sort of interval type of stuff. I do it in the morning at night. You can still do some activity, uh, light training at night or what I love to do is just go for a walk or a little bike ride at night. Just, you know, kind of a restful one around the block. I'm not doing like a, you know, sprint up the mountain kind of thing, which I usually do in the morning on my bike. Um, but at night, uh, three hours before bed, we'll say the three is for the food, no food consumption, have a food curfew, two hours, no high intensity exercise, and then one hour before bed, um, and try to limit and really stop, extinguish, stop those, stop those blue light emitting devices. No more screen time the last one hour before bed. And I'll kind of make that a corollary is, is try to stop the work, whatever the work that you're working on. Most of us, it's easy because if we're stopping the screens, we're usually stopping our work because we do most of our work on a computer. Um, and so at least one hour before bed, kind of use that as the cool down. And then you replace that with whatever the heck you want. Everybody's different. I love to have a little restful routine for myself. If I'm in a place where I can get in a hot tub or a hot bath, I love that as a kind of cool down, de-stressor, relax kind of a thing. Um, I love to journal. I love to um, just have a little gratitude um, exercise. I'd like to write down five things that I'm grateful for either that day in particular or whatever comes up in my mind. So that kind of goes with journaling, journaling, uh, gratitude, a meditation practice of some kind can be amazing. Uh, I personally don't do a big, big meditation right before bed. If I did, I would just end up sleeping, sitting up or something. I'm usually sitting up when I meditate. Um, but a meditation practice, sometimes I'll do a brief, like five or 10 minute one, just to kind of get me grooving in the mood that I want to be in, kind of restful and thoughtful and, and have the brain dump, you know, because a lot of times we, I think if we go from zero to 60 and we just literally put our computers away, close the laptop screen or our phone or whatever, and then we set it down on our nightstand, eh, 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 eh. that's a little bit of a no-no. Try to get that uh, device out of the room. Um, and put it elsewhere forget about you know just the distracted you know thing that would happen if it's there and the things lighten up and whatever put it on airplane mode or just better yet just take it out of the room so you don't get the emfs either but if you extinguish that or stop that right before bed your brain's still going right you're still thinking about all the to-do list for tomorrow you're thinking about all the stuff that happened today you don't have any wind down so have at least a one hour wind down period and i love to do the activities i just mentioned a hot bath or just jump in a hot tub um, journal or, or do a gratitude exercise, do a short meditation, do what I like to do with that, that thing that I held up, the book, just actually read a book. And as I do, my wife kind of cracks up, I do a little night light that's amber, uh, book light I should say, because I don't like to have the lights in the room on, get rid of the ambient light and kind of get settled. So that's kind of the three, two, one. I love, love, love to, to use each and every night, the food curfew, the exercise curfew, the work curfew or, or blue light curfew, and then do all the cool restful things that you wanna do at night. And, and remember, part of that is your bedroom. Like you gotta create the ambiance, right? I call it the sleep sanctuary. It's gotta be a place that when you go there, you feel like I can really relax and wind down. So if you're doing all your work in the bedroom, you're sitting at your laptop in your bed, like with that thing open until the moment you wanna to go to sleep, you're confusing all the signals. Your body's like, what the heck? You just were in this full work mode? Like, how are you gonna to go to sleep right away? Like, you're, you're gonna have trouble. So try to do your work elsewhere or have at least an area of your bedroom where you have your desk and that's separate. And then you use the bed for, yeah, the two S's, right? For sleep and of course, you know, if you have a partner for the other thing that we enjoy doing in a bed, right? The sex, because that's amazing and it can actually, believe it or not, help you sleep. Yeah, yeah, getting the the <laughs> the O, right? The O, the orgasm before a bed, that can actually help us kind of be mellow and get into that nice, deep, awesome sleep later in the night. I mean, it's just a nice, um, you know, nice thing to do with somebody you love, your partner, and then, you know, 
being able to actually get into a real restful state to be able to sleep is amazing too. So save your bed for the two S's, right? And not for work, not for watching TV. Like if you're gonna watch TV, go watch a movie night with your spouse, do that in the living room or, or different area of the house because like if that's on, on in the bedtime, it can blow your whole regular routine. And of course the blue lights just wake you up. But I do do a movie night occasionally with my wife. Um, and we do it out in the living room uh, predominantly because that's, that just you know makes more sense. That way we can use the bed for the two S's, which don't include watching a movie or TV. <laughs> anyway, um, so that environment and the routine is so critical for getting an amazing restful sleep. While we're talking about that, um, we'll segue into kind of the environment part of things. I, I, I did a whole course on this a while back, and if you guys need super deep dives, you need action steps, really carefully delineated, check out my sleep course. You can find it on my website, thomashemingway.com, or on my link tree on Instagram, because sleep, there's so much, and I can't cover everything, but I, I will make a little note of the environment is critical. And right now, I can tell you more than anything, and I only really this summer, to be honest, am really doing what I always preach, which is it's got to be like a cave. I call it the sleep cave, probably because I'm a dude and, you know, we, we all love this concept of the man cave, but you can call it the sleep sanctuary. And it should be, it should be cold. It should be cool. You got to cool it down. And right now in Hawaii, it gets super warm during the day. We don't have AC. And at night, oh my gosh, it's still warm, takes forever to cool off. So we actually just this summer for the first time ever got one of those little portable like, you know, Home Depot, Costco AC things that you throw up in the in the window and close the window on it. And we're cranking that thing up at night. And I'll be honest, I'm sleeping better than ever before in the summer because it's cooler. You got to set the stage. You got to be cool. In fact, your body naturally, when it gets sleepy and wants to fall asleep, it drops its internal temperature it actually cools down and if you can't cool down you're gonna have trouble getting to sleep and there's lots of data on this i shared this a lot in the course but you gotta get the temperature down 68 is kind of that number that you always hear about and it's it varies it's whatever is best for you but i would say anything over about 75 is too warm for sleeping or anything under maybe like 55 is too cold you're gonna be you know like well if you're all bundled up and stuff maybe but there's dudes out there i know that crank it down to the 50s and i think that's a little insane but somewhere between like 68 and 72 3 something like that should work but um, probably not much above 75 and in hawaii if you don't have ac it's super hard to get down to that at night in the summer because it's usually high 70s at night and if your house has been baking in the sun like our bedroom bakes the whole afternoon because it it is <laughs> facing the uh, direction of sunset, which is out to the west, and it just gets baked, baked, baked all afternoon, south facing, and it's not good. So anyway, sleep, sanctuary, make it cold, make it cool, make it dark. This is probably the easiest, simplest, I would say biggest bang for your buck, because it's way cheaper than buying an AC, is just buying some blackout curtains. If you don't have them, consider them, because this was a game changer for me. Once I got my room dark and black and blacked out all that exterior light that was coming in from whether it be a street light or wherever, um, it was a game changer. Or the moonlight, like actually right now, it's about a full moon. If I don't have my blackouts closed, like sometimes my wife likes to sleep with the, the drapes open just to, I don't know why, maybe to help her wake up in the morning. But I personally, I hate it because it's too bright. I can't do it, especially right now. It's literally like full moon and it's like, you can see everything at night. And I don't wanna see everything. I wanna to go to sleep. I wanna not see that hand in front of my face. Get the room dark. So cool and dark. And the third part about that, about the sleep sanctuary or the sleep cave, as I like to call it, is you gotta have it quiet. So whatever you have to do to get it quiet, like here, people that come visit me, they go bananas because we got so many roosters who literally crow all night long. Like forget about this just sunrise thing. Like they crow the whole dang night. I don't know, these guys are wacky, but they crow all night. And so you might need some earplugs, like whatever that is for you or a white noise, white machine, uh, whatever it is, noisemaker machine for white noise, whatever you need to do, you know, have a fan blowing on you. Like that's what I was using for my white noise is a fan blowing on me because I don't really like the earplugs, but uh, something to help you with that quiet. It's gotta be quiet, right? And that dark thing, I mean, I, for me, that's pretty much become 
a non-debatable. My wife, she goes for it now. Like she notices too. She sleeps better. But it took a little, it took a little bit because she wasn't always into it. She liked having the window open or whatever and seeing the moonlight. I was like, oh my gosh, it's too bright. But uh, that's why dudes back in the day, right? We went into caves. We went into places that were dark <laughs> at night. So keep it dark. Keep it cool. Keep it quiet, right? And have that regular routine. So dang important. All right. So we got, we set the stage. There's a couple other things when we're, we're considering having these curfews, right? The, the food curfew, the exercise curfew, the work curfew. Well, also we should have a little bit of a curfew on some other things. Like if we're coffee drinkers, for example, would not be recommending that before bed. Like, I don't know how anybody can have coffee at night, like with their dinner, like even decaf. Like I just, I don't know, couldn't do it. I have to avoid any kind of caffeine by lunchtime pretty much, or it messes with my sleep. But I would say for most people within about six hours, a bedtime is kind of what the data shows. So if you go to bed at 10 o'clock at me, like me, about 4 p.m., you shouldn't be having any caffeine after that. So have a curfew on your caffeine. And also for that matter, have a curfew on your alcohol um, or just be not having any significant alcohol. You know, if you do your little bit of wine at night, just don't do too much. Don't do the bottle, right? Don't drink the whole bottle because alcohol will really disrupt the quality of your sleep. Now, you may be saying, hey, well, when I have some drinks, I go to bed so easily. I just fall asleep like a baby. Well, you may fall asleep real easily, but you often will wake up. And when you do wake up, you're like totally messed up if you especially have too much to drink because you will not be able to do all the functions that your body likes to do during sleep because alcohol decreases the quality of your sleep. Like we've all either had or seen or seen someone who's had a hangover, right? They've had too much to drink, and then they wake up and they're like, what in the world happened? I don't remember anything. Well, that's because your brain needs to have that deep restful sleep. If you don't get into stage three and four sleep at night, that's where literally your body makes the memories. It establishes them. And if you're drinking alcohol, you can't get into those deep phases of sleep. And so those memories don't get established and you don't remember. And, and besides that, the quality of your sleep just sucks and your brain can't do all the stuff it's supposed to do at night if it had a bunch of alcohol prior. So alcohol messes with your sleep quality. It messes with your ability to remember things, of course. I think we all have either seen or had that experience. And um, it's not awesome. So try to limit your alcohol intake um, altogether. If you're a fan of Dr. Amen, oh, I love that guy, he's amazing. He will say indiscriminately and authoritatively that any amount of alcohol is no good for the brain because literally alcohol shrinks the brain, right? This is not a, this is not a podcast on alcohol, but he's right. I've actually seen thousands and thousands of scans in my time as a physician and any alcoholic that I've ever seen has a smaller, more shrunken brain. It's the truth. It does shrink your brain. So food for thought, check out Doc Amen on Instagram if you want to follow him. He's incredible. But he gives that message very commonly and repeatedly because he's looking at millions of scans and he's never seen one where the alcohol actually improved the quality of the brain scan or the brain function for that matter. It always shrinks the brain. So, all right. Where are we now? We talked about environment, so important, cool, dark, and quiet. A couple of things to avoid, right? No caffeine before bed. Try to avoid too much alcohol before bed. Um, let's do some fun things that may help calm us. Um, we talked about kind of routine type things that can calm us, like a hot bath, some meditation, some gratitude, some journaling, read a book, that sort of thing. But there are actually, there are some supplements out there um, that could be helpful here. Uh, one of my favorites is just a simple, you know, kind of a tea. Uh, I think we've all heard of like a chamomile tea, which is very restful, relaxing. Um, one of the things that is nice that there's no significant calories there, right? We talked about not having any significant calories at night because that will mess with the quality of our sleep. But there are some things we could have at bedtime, like a little sip of a chamomile tea has been shown to kind of help get us into that restful place. Other other things that may be helpful, um, if you're from Fiji, the Fijians love, love, love a beverage called kava. Um, if you've ever been there, you've for sure probably done a kava ceremony. It's kind of it's kind of spread all throughout um, that whole area, Fiji, um, 
Tahiti, all these places, they, they kind of have adopted that. Even the other island groups like Tonga, Samoa, they tend to do the kava kava ceremonies and, and many of them drink it each and every night. It tends to encourage a restful uh, state. So kava kava, um, what did I say? Of course, the uh, tea, like chamomile, that's the classic. Um, my favorite for bedtime, I just love to take some good old fashioned mighty mineral of magnesium. Most of us are deficient anyway. That's probably one of the most common mineral deficiencies in, in us worldwide. I think probably near 80% of us are deficient in the magnesium and its proper functioning in the body and we could all benefit from a little bit. So I take magnesium each and every night and it helps me not only to have a restful sleep. I personally take about two grams. It's kind of a lot, but uh, uh, it's amazing. It helps me so much. That's 2000 milligrams. And I try to take um, a split between magnesium glycinate and magnesium threonine. I like the threonine because it crosses the uh, blood brain barrier. And I should say three and eight magnesium and also magnesium uh, glycinate. So three and eight and glycinate. That's kind of the combo I take at night, a gram of each. And that helps me get into that restful sleep. The three and eight I like because it crosses the blood brain barrier it really gets up there it kind of mellows your mood and it's uh it's just amazing it helps you just get that calm restful sleep so i personally love magnesium there's some benefits uh, of lavender as well you could even toss it into your tub and do a soak in lavender but that's a kind of calming herb as well uh, theanine there is actually an amino acid theanine I, I misspoke i was kind of getting excited about sharing that too but it's magnesium three and eight and then L-theanine is an amino acid that can improve relaxation and sleep. Yeah, a typical dose somewhere about 100 to 200 milligrams. Um, valerian root, I don't know if I mentioned that yet. That's another common one that can be helpful. And it can help you fall asleep and also can actually improve the sleep quality. It's a, a natural herb. Um, somewhere around 500 milligrams is a kind of common dose for valerian root. Or there's teas with it as well. Um, I like good old fashioned, I was, I was telling you that protein before bed, or at least in your final meal, I, I don't eat it before bed, but protein, especially like glycine, um, can help with sleep. And one of the things that glycine is super commonly found in is bone broth. Like literally glycine is what makes up collagen. Remember that from the collagen podcast, we talked about glycine, um, how it's the predominant uh, amino acid in collagen, and collagen is the predominant protein in our whole entire body. So you know, that that uh, evening meal, try to have protein in it and try to have glycine. You can even take glycine separately as a supplement, um, about three grams. It's showing, uh, there's studies that looked at that specifically showing that that can improve uh, sleep quality. Others, I, I won't have time to really get into these, but ginkgo um, has some relaxation type uh, techniques. Of course, that's, uh, or I should say, effects, ginkgo biloba. Um, usually somewhere between 250 milligrams, about you know an hour before bed, something like that, 30 to 60 minutes before bed. Um, what I haven't talked about, and I, I kind of do this on purpose, is melatonin. So melatonin, yes, it can help you with sleep, but it's really honestly not something I recommend like each and every day. I really feel like taking too much melatonin can have detrimental uh, downstream effects, and it can also downregulate your body's own ability to produce because your body makes melatonin, right? It releases it from the pineal gland. That's what actually gets you into that kind of evening mode and getting prepared for sleep is the release of melatonin, which basically happens when it gets dark, right? That's kind of the natural cue. When it gets dark outside, pineal um, gland says, hey, it's time to release that melatonin, kind of get us in the groove for our evening restful rituals and sleep. And that's what happens. But if you take it each and every night, you can actually has this uh, what's called a negative feedback loop that you can actually suppress your body's own ability to make it, which all of us hopefully are able to do. And so I only recommend melatonin really for short term incidences where you're struggling with sleep, say it's uh, related to jet lag or something like that. Um, that would be a good indication for some melatonin. And take the smallest dose possible. I re recently did a podcast uh, where I talked about this and I just don't recommend it each and every day. Although it's kind of natural and most people consider it safe and things like that, I just don't think it's a great idea to do it each and every day. Do it the smallest dose possible and for the shortest time possible, which I just find to be in certain situations where you're needing to adjust to a new time zone, um, where you're traveling, you've crossed several time zones. Melatonin can be helpful, especially with jet lag. There's some other things that will help with that, which we'll get into farther on down the list. But uh, 
I just wouldn't take it each and every day. So I'm not going to do a whole podcast on melatonin. I just don't feel like it's it's great for everyday use, but it is good for certain scenarios, especially jet lag and for um, you know different situations where you, you're, there's some routine change and you need some help kind of getting to sleep uh, out of characteristic for you because it's a different environment or whatever it is um, in that respect. So the other thing, I'll just get into this now because I travel a lot. I often cross six time zones. Like I took a trip, I had to do some things out in Florida a few weeks back. And so I flew from uh, Hawaii to Florida, which is six hours <laughs> time difference, you know, six time zones. And it was a little bit wacky, but, and it was only like a three day trip. It was super brief. I had to do a few things while I was there and just come right back. And so it was, it was really a big stimulus to mess up my circadian rhythm. But one thing I did, I actually didn't even take melatonin because I knew I was coming right back to Hawaii. And so what I did there to help me adjust was I got up every morning at sunrise. Like I had that natural light hit my eyes. And it's amazing because East Coast, like you get to see the sun come up over the water. Like it's pretty incredible. So I got to see the sunrise. But what I also did is I tried to walk around barefoot um, to get grounded. You know, there's a lot of negative uh, electrons uh, and magnetic. The earth is magnetic. We also have, uh, we're electric and magnetic as well. We have electrical a potential in all of our cells and that's kind of what makes us tick it's what makes our heart beat it's why we can see our heart rhythm on a heart monitor because we are electrical the body is electrical and when we ground ourselves we kind of get synchronized if you will with the electrical fields and magnetic fields of the earth and that in that specific environment that we're in if we get grounded that's going to help us sleep there's you know people call it grounding some people call it earthing so there's different words for the same thing but just slip your shoes off and the summer is an amazing time to do this and this is part of the reason why if you go out to a lake house or a beach house and you're walking around barefoot and you're like oh my gosh i'm having the most amazing sleeps each and every night that's because of this phenomenon the earthing or the grounding that happens when you get synchronized to that that area with the electromagnetic fields through just slipping off your shoes so there's there's fancy tools and equipment right you can buy those grounding mats you can buy grounding sheets there's all these kind of fancy things and they probably all have some benefit but they're expensive why not just slip your shoes off go for a little walk what i do at night is i just slip my shoes off and i just walk outside have my feet touch the wet cement it's often wet here in hawaii or just the wet grass and like it's a five minute thing i'm not doing it for hours or whatever but that grounding is super super helpful and it's just freaking awesome to be outside in nature if you can walk on a beach this is what i recommend if you're traveling you have to go across a whole bunch of time zones if there's any kind of a beach or a lake or some place that you can have your feet touch a damp natural environment that's going to really help with your grounding even if you just go to a park and there's a little dewy usually at, at night and early in the morning you have that kind of dewy kind of moist grass it's a perfect time to walk around barefoot and it's amazing it feels great and it's free it's absolutely free absolutely free so i wanted to just mention that because i've benefited tremendously from grounding over the years especially with travel and with significant uh, jet lag i've really benefited significantly from that so i wanted to share that that was on my list um one thing i kind of forgot to mention it was on my environment list but i, I wasn't really looking at my list it's basically besides the stuff we talked about a cool dark quiet room routine and all those things is just having a comfortable mattress i think it kind of goes without saying right a comfortable mattress and this is where i'm kind of in this debate a little bit with my wife because she doesn't like it too cold so i'm gonna get one of these sleeping pads they have cooling pads that you can sleep on and uh if you, any of you guys have one that you've had amazing there's there's about three or four that i'm considering i haven't i haven't set up to to pull the trigger on one over the other. I wanna get kind of the best one for me. And and so if you know, just just message me on Instagram or whatever, reach out, tell me what's the best one. Um, but I may get one of these because we sleep at different temperatures, right? She likes it warmer, I like it cooler. So a cooling pad, it's kind of a good compromise because she just won't let me put it at 68. Like she just, I think we usually set it at either 70 or 72, I forget. I always hope it's 70, but she always sneaks it up on me. And so the thermostat kind of, we play this arm wrestling match with the thermostat. But I think my solution is going to get one of these uh, cooling blankets. Um, but that's that's another thing is the environment where you are should also be comfortable, right? It should go without seeing. I, I call it a sleep sanctuary for a reason. It should be comfortable. So a comfortable bed, a comfortable pillow, I found that to be a game changer. There's a certain curvature of your neck and if you don't know much about this there's actually been some amazing 
uh, podcasts that talk directly of this um, about that natural curvature that you're supposed to have. There, there's these kind of special cervical, they call them cervical, it's just the neck vertebrae. It's called your cervical vertebrae. You can just Google it cervical pillow, these special pillows that really kind of keep your body perfectly adjusted, not only for sleep, but also for folks that may have sleep apnea. This is a something I haven't talked about yet, but you should, if you're having a lot of sleep trouble, especially if you've noticed you have daytime sleepiness and you don't have a partner to whack you and say, hey, you're snoring too much. And so it's not obvious to you. You should get your sleep investigate a study do a sleep study and they can tell you if you have sleep apnea or not because actually a lot of people have it traditionally it's dudes that get it but but gals women can get sleep apnea just as well and you don't have to be overweight to get it. that's kind of the common natural thought the body habit as well it's just because you're overweight or whatever that's sometimes the case but it's not always the case you can have redundant tissue in the back of your mouth your adenoids you know that tissue all relaxes at night and you can have some obstructive, that's why it's called obstructive sleep apnea, OSA, obstructive, because there's some blockage of the airflow. And then, duh, if you're not oxygenating your brain and your body, you're not gonna be well rested the next day. And actually, this has been shown to be the cause in a lot of cases of high blood pressure. Somebody just messaged me this week about blood pressure, and I, when I respond to her, I haven't had the chance to yet, it's, I'm gonna add this to the response that check yourself for sleep apnea because that's one of the reversible causes of high blood pressure, sleep apnea. So get yourself checked out if you're having sleep trouble or your partner says you're having sleep trouble, you're snoring a lot, get investigated, do that sleep you know, study, it's called the sleep study, and see if you have sleep apnea. Because it's actually really common and it's common across both men and women. And especially if you notice you're like struggling in the day, you get real sleepy during the day, this could be it, obstructive sleep apnea. So get checked out for it. Make sure your environment is really clued into this, restful, cool, dark, uh, and quiet, but have a good both pillow and mattress. And you might consider getting one of these cervical pillows, they're, they're called, and there's all different ones out there. There's like the really super fancy pants ones designed by this uh, pretty bright chiropractor dude. I, I can't think of his name at the moment, but uh, cervical pillow, you may benefit from that. Um, and also with respect to the curfews, I, I forgot, I just, <laughs> just checked my list here, but with respect to the curfews, we talked about a food curfew, uh, alcohol and caffeine curfew. Well, actually I also have a little bit of a curfew on liquids. So here's the deal, right? I'm getting up uh, near 50 and I've noticed that if I drink too much water at night, well, what do I got to do? Well, duh, I got to get up and pee. So I don't want to get up and pee at night because then that messes with my sleep. You know, I don't want it wakes me up a little bit. So my goal is actually to limit the amount of fluids I drink at night and really focus on getting my fluids in during the day. In fact, I have a routine and it's an Ayurvedic practice. In fact, and I'll, maybe I'll even ask Dr. Axe, uh, he's, he's pretty pretty well versed in Ayurvedic medicine, but a big giant glass of water every morning, at least 20 ounces, that's how I start my day. And I know that's an Ayurvedic practice as well, but I don't do that at night. And I don't do that precisely because I don't want to be waking up, you know, to pee. So I wouldn't drink any significant fluid somewhere at least between one and two hours. Um, if you want to just have your last big fluid with your meal three hours before bed, that's fine. I have a couple of gulps of fluid, um, closer to bedtime because I like to take some supplements right at bedtime that may or may not be sleep supplements or I typically take a probiotic at night because then it has the whole night to kind of act. And But I don't drink a bunch. I used to drink it with a bigger cup of water. Now I just drink the minimum. I just do one gulp and pow, as we say in Hawaii, ne, pow means you're finished, you're done, and that's it. So I don't drink a lot of fluids <laughs> right before bedtime. So the bottom line, as we know, is you gotta, number one, make sleep your priority. Make it your superpower, as we started off with. And to do that, go back and listen to last week's podcast when we talked about all the reasons why sleep is awesome. Why you need sleep, because I didn't know this. In medical school, they did not teach me this. A lot of the science just came out in the year 2012 with the folks at the University of Rochester when they discovered the glymphatic system and we got to learn like, at night, that's really the only time you get to flush out the toxins. You get to flush all the crap out of your brain, the amyloid, the tau, all the, all the toxins you get exposed to during the day, and you get to rejuvenate, you get to refresh, and that happens at night. So we need to sleep. Number one, you gotta make that your priority. Put it in your phone, make it so, do the routine, have a routine. The three, two, one is what works for me, and have the environment that we talked about, the sleep sanctuary or the sleep cave um, all of that good stuff. Make sure you're comfortable. It's dark. 
Make sure you don't have a sleep disorder. Do all the relaxing stuff that last hour before bed, whether that be a journal or gratitude technique, meditation, a warm bath, um, sexy time with your spouse, whatever, whatever that is, you know, that's uh, really crucial that last hour before bed to have restful practices. And, you know, if you need some supplements to help you, we talked about a few today. We talked about ginkgo. We talked about glycine, one of my favorite amino acids, which I'm going to ask Dr. Axe about this because I know he loves collagen, but why not a little bit of bone broth before bed? Like that's a cool time to not only help with the glycine intake to help you sleep, but also the rejuvenation that happens during sleep. So I think I'm going to ask him about that as well. Valerian root, we talked about magnesium, my personal favorite, take it each and every night, L-theanine, lavender. And if you're traveling and you need to, melatonin is not a bad idea as well. But having the routine, um, I didn't talk about this, but I'll just briefly mention it. Naps. Generally speaking, I'm not a fan of naps because they can mess up your sleep routine with the caveat that if you need a quick like 30 minute or less power nap, then that's okay. So here, here's a quick example. We flew to Europe, uh, in fact, Portugal to be exact, and I forget, might have been 12 time zones. It was a lot. I forget how many time zones we crossed, but it was really, really different. And when we first got there, we went out and about and saw some sights. I had to drive a couple hours to get to our hotel, which was in a different area. But then we were like, oh my gosh, we were feeling bad because we, you know, it was one of these where you slept or supposedly slept overnight, but you didn't really sleep because it's an airplane, it's hard to sleep. And I, my wife and I actually did go to the hotel. We took a 30 minute, we set our alarm. We literally set the alarm, 30 minute power nap. And then we got up, we went for a walk, we stayed out the rest of the afternoon, we stayed out, had dinner at one of the local places and it was amazing. And then we went to bed at the usual local hour, whatever it was, I think we were trying to go to bed about the same time as we do here, 10 o'clock. And you know what, we adapted, it was amazing. Like literally the next day I felt totally fine. We crossed like 12 time zones, we're totally messed up, but because we didn't take a big nap, like I could have easily slept who knows, maybe that nap and it was like middle of the afternoon, I could, probably could have slept the whole night, but we just did a quick power nap. Then we did the, we were out actually at sunset, we did a walk and then we ate dinner, kind of did all the local stuff at the pro uh, proper circadian times and it worked perfectly and we didn't even take melatonin. So shout out to natural daylight during the day, like the best sleep remedy is what starts with the daylight, with the sunrise, the outdoor time, see that natural light getting synchronize with that rhythm and you may not need a lot of this other stuff but but there there are some things that can help like i said if you're doing traveling and you need something to help with jet lag that would be a case where melatonin may come into play but also don't forget grounding right so so important oh my gosh I feel like we just went through a whole bunch how about a quick applause <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to do that. But uh, anyway, it's been it's been a great podcast. We've had so many tips and tricks and tools. I hope this is really practical for you that you can actually go back with your list. I forget how many things I think we did about 15 or so was on my list. Um, well over a dozen, but they basically all boil down to natural light during the day, having a consistent rhythm. And some of those curfews are important. The three, two, one rule that we talked about, and then just getting our sleep sanctuary all set up with a cool environment, relatively quiet, noise-free, and it's gotta be dark. It's gotta be dark. So get those blackout curtains. Maybe that's the only purchase you'll have to do and it'll change your sleep forever. It's amazing. And the other stuff is gravy too. If you need a supplement here or there, I made a list of a few things that can be helpful, but I would say getting your daylight cycle synchronized, one of the most helpful blackout curtains, amazing. You know, got to get that blue light off at least an hour before bed and don't eat right before bed. And then environmental stuff, do all that stuff that we talked about. You may need to get checked out for sleep apnea because that could be why you're struggling with sleep and you're so dang tired during the day. Check it out. Ask your partner if you snore. It could be life changing and it could even fix your blood pressure too. So all that cool stuff, reach out to me, Dr. Dr. Thomas Hemingway. That's at Instagram and then thomashemingway.com on my website. All the links there if you want to get my sleep course where we go through all this stuff. We make goals. There's even a PDF to come with it. It should be available there as well, thomashemingway.com or on Instagram at my link tree. So a big aloha until next time. Oh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss out on any future episode. And 
I'd love to hear your comments and feedback. If there's any topic you'd love to hear about, you're dying to know, burning questions, please comment below and let me know what future topics are of interest to you.